Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be talking about China as the sleeping giant in our continuing study of world civilizations. In a previous class, we looked at the various river valley cultures, uh, Egypt, Mesopotamia, the Indus Valley, and then China. Um, and China described themselves as the Middle Kingdom. That's not middle in the sense of uh, Middle Ages like we talk about uh, time-wise, but rather they thought of themselves as the center of the world. And so uh, if you were in China, there were places to the east, uh, like Japan or Korea. There were places in the west, uh, the rest of the European and, and Asiatic and African uh, areas. But they saw themselves as the center of the world, the Middle Kingdom. Uh, it's interesting to look at China, the, the country as it exists today, um, and superimpose notice uh, over the United States just to get a si uh, an idea of the size of the country. Um, it's actually larger than the continental United States. And it's interesting also to compare China and the United States. Uh, they are both in the northern hemisphere. Uh, they both have extensive coastlines, and they both have very diverse topographies um, with a Wild West frontier. Um, uh, not Indians, but still other people groups that are in the West uh, as opposed to that which you have in the East. So civilization started in the East and then moved toward the West. In the, in the way the United States is made up by one major river, the Mississippi, in China, it is made up by two major rivers. You have the, the Yellow River in the north and the Yangtze in the south. Uh, the Yangtze is, is one of the three largest rivers in the world. Um, no, notice uh, everything flows toward the east, and uh, the largest uh, group of people are there on the east as well. This is The further you go to the east, the more highly populated is the country. Now, in a previous class, we talked about the early dynasties. So just by way of review, uh, we have the Xia dynasty from 2100 to 1600 BC. Uh, really, uh, what we have uh, from them is mostly uh, uh, mythological, and, and yet it was a dynasty that actually existed. This was the, older, uh, the early culture on the Yellow River, that r river to the north. Um, and then from 1600 to 1046, BC, you have the Shang Dynasty. This is where you have the dragon bone writings. And so writing has now begun to appear. Uh, this is their Bronze Age, and it ends with a planetary alignment uh, that just happens to sort of coincide with the end of the dynasty. And yet that's going to give rise, as we come to the Zhu Dynasty, this idea of the majesty of heaven, that the heavens conspire. Um, and you say, well, are the heavens up there thinking about it? Uh, no, they're, they're viewed as impersonal, and yet they bring about the end of a dynasty uh, because that dynasty and that line of kings no longer has the mandate of heaven. Uh, and so uh, now a new dynasty arises, and it's in the Zhu dynasty uh, from 1027 to uh, 221 BC. We have the feudal system in China develop. Uh, Sun Tzu writes his epic book, The Art of War, which is still required reading in, uh, in military schools today. And this is also the time when Confucius uh, comes on the scene and he, uh, he sets forth a tradition and a way of thinking that still has impacted uh, a lot of the world even today. Next, we have the Qin Dynasty. Uh, Qin Shi Huang takes the title of emperor. The, the rulers, kings before this, had not taken that title prior to this. Notice that Qing Dynasty, it's very short from 221 to 206 BC, and yet it's going to give China its name. This is where the name China comes from. Uh, all conflicting books are burned, and uh, this is the emperor who uh, has built for himself his terracotta army, uh, which is one of, I, I think, uh, just an amazing feat. Uh, these uh, very, various uh, terracotta warriors, literally hundreds and thousands, um, each with its individual face and pose and so on. The Han Dynasty goes from 202 to 220 AD. Uh, this is the time when the writings of Confucius, which had been written quite a bit earlier, but now they are collected. And also uh, both the 
the study of Confucius and other educational requirements are made for public office so that public office will no longer be on the basis of uh, whom you are related to, but rather it will be on the basis of your educational uh, requirements. And uh, uh, there will be testing set up in order to hold uh, public office. The invention of paper goes back to this time. That's not going to make it uh, to the West, uh, perhaps because paper doesn't last so well when you're carrying it over long distances. Um, but paper will be invented in the East. Uh, you have the Silk Road and travel uh, beginning to come West with uh, many things. In fact, the reason why it's called, called the, the Silk Road is because one of the things that is traveling that will weather that very long distance uh, over trade routes is silk. And uh, that's a closely guarded secret in how to make it. Eventually, we're going to p see people in Europe uh, trying to capture the the technique for making silk. They'll, they'll actually uh, try to have that transported uh, to the West. And also, Buddhism is introduced. Remember, Buddhism comes from India. So it's introduced now into China at this time. Now, we come to the end of the Han Dynasty, and we enter a period of disunity. And I likened this in the previous class, and this is where we, where we ended the previous class. Uh, we looked at uh, the difference between, uh, and, and comparisons also, between Rome and the Han Dynasty. Uh, and in both cases, uh, things sort of fell apart. In Rome, you had the western part of the empire that broke up. Uh, likewise, here in China, you had uh, three competing kingdoms, the Wei, the Wu, and the Smu. Uh, and uh, Sima Yi leads a revolt against the Wei and then briefly reunites all of China. So um, it's separated and then it comes back. Remember how Justinian <laughs> uh, does the same thing. He brings the Roman Empire back together, but it doesn't last. And so um, at the end of this time, northern nomads enter China. Now begins an era of 16 kingdoms. You can see that China has fragmented, but the, uh, the 16 kingdoms are in the north. They are ruled by non-Chinese, just like in, in uh, Europe. You had had the barbarians come down from the north and, and begin to take over and fragment all of Europe. And so this is happening in China as well. Um, the dynasties in the south are ruled by Chinese. So you have the non-Chinese ruling in the, in the north. Chinese are still there but they are not in charge. Um, in, in the South, the dynasties are ruling, and this is, this is China ruling. And Buddhism now begins to gain in popularity. It had been introduced much earlier, but uh, it had been a very uh, minority uh, school of thinking, but now it begins to grow in popularity. Now we come to the Sui dynasty. This is uh, at the end of 400 years of warfare between competing houses. Uh, things finally come together. Uh, the establishment of agricultural colon colonies for border defense, uh, sort of the idea of buffer states. We could think of it in that way. And uh, work starts during this dynasty on the Grand Canal. This is going to be a construction feat that will take those two rivers, the Yellow River and the Yangtze, and connect them. They are not near to each other. So these canals are going to be many hundreds of miles long, a single canal that will unite the country. It would eventually stretch 1,100 miles as we link the Yellow River to the Yangtze. High taxes, because you have to pay for these construction projects, you have to pay for the canal, that those high taxes are going to lead to revolt. And now I've got three dynasties on, on this map. First of all, in the green, we have the Sui dynasty we just talked about. Uh, and you can see uh, both the rivers, but also the canals that are being built. They're not, it's not in a straight line because after all those mountains in the way, they have to go around the mountains. Um, um, and then we're going to move, notice the red, it's going to be extended out uh, to take in the Tang Dynasty from 618 to 907. And then we'll come back again uh, for the Song Dynasty. So we're looking at three dynasties on this particular map. The Tang Dynasty, uh, 618 to 906, uh, Tang uh, reunites China. And Li Chimnin, also known as Taizong, uh, is the founder of the dynasty. 
Uh, he's the emperor, becomes emperor in uh, 626 AD when his father retires. Uh, you could actually say his father uh, uh, founds the dynasty, but he's the one who's going to, to bring it to prominence. And Alopen, a Christian monk, is invited to come in and translate the Bible, the Christian Bible, into Chinese. Now, that's interesting that, that we've, we've seen Buddhism and Confucianism um, initially come in very small, but then grow. And now the same thing happens uh, with Christianity. Now, we, next we come to the Empress Wu Zeo. Uh, she's the concubine of Taizong, and uh, she marries his son after the emperor died. So she's both the, the, uh, the queen mother, but also the, the queen queen. Uh, and then she rules when her new husband is incapacitated with a stroke. This takes place in the year 655. And now she becomes the empress. She takes actually the title of emperor. I'm not even sure if you have a title, a, a, a word empress in Chinese. Uh, but she takes upon the title of emperor, and she will rule the, uh, for a time. Um, it's uh, actually um, considered to be sort of a, a time of struggle and political strife, um, and she's ruling uh, until her death. Now, the Tang Dynasty, as we said, is going to extend outward to the west uh, and take in some of that area which, will, which traditionally had not been part of China, uh, notice we're extending the boundaries of China, of China to the West. The, the, we could think of it as the Wild West. And it's during the Tang Dynasty that industry and, flit and trade begin to flourish. Uh, notice we've outlined there the Silk Road. Uh, it's an overland route uh, that is taking products uh, from China uh, to the West. Um, the trade will reach places like Arabia and India and Japan. So uh, here on, on our chart, we're looking toward the west, but Japan notices to the east, uh, to Persia as well. And ocean routes uh, now begin to take precedent because if you're traveling by sea, it can be um, not necessarily easier, uh, but it will have a different set of challenges as opposed to going, there's a lot of mountains in the way. Um, and you say, well, there's, there's a lot of coastline that's not necessarily uh, straight and flat. And, and those are issues as well. Now, it's around this time that we have the story uh, uh, that is put into song, The Ballad of Mulan. Uh, Disney actually made a movie of this, and I think they made a, a new movie of it as well. I haven't seen the new one. I have seen the cartoon. Uh, but it's it had been written prior to the Tang Dynasty, and of course the story had taken place in an earlier age. But now it again becomes uh, popular, and it's the story of a daughter who enlists in the army in place of her aged father. And, and uh, she's the hero of the story, and uh, this becomes very popular. This is uh, from this, uh, this era when, when it rises to national prominence. Uh, the story goes that she serves for 12 years uh, as you know, within the army and becomes this warrior and um, one that all can look up to. Uh, I find it interesting that you have a woman hero, and, and this becomes prominent after you'd had a woman emperor. Now, a rebellion goes from 755 to 763, where the emperor Zhuanzang takes his son's concubine as his own. Uh, that was considered to be um, uh, a great dishonor. Remember, we're in a, cult a culture that looks at honor and shame, and, and those are major qualities. Uh, and she's supposedly implicated in the rebellion. And so notice it's going from, from father to son to re rebellion in the household. Uh, the people demand her execution, uh, and the emperor finally abdicates um, and uh, steps down. The Tang Dynasty survives after this, but it's going to be considerably weaker. So you've got uh, the Tang Dynasty starting uh, with, a, with a bang and ending perhaps more with a whimper. Next, we have the Song Dynasty. We're going from 960 to 1279. Uh, uh, notice this is going to take in the era where in the West they are having the Crusades. Um, a military commander 
usurps the throne. That's how the dynasty begins. But because the military has been used to take the throne, this dynasty is going to see something of a distrust in the military. And so the military now will be put under civil administrators so that there won't be that that danger of having a military takeover. And a huge bureaucracy will develop based on Confucianism. And you say, well, a huge bureaucracy, we've seen problems in the past where taxation brings a dynasty down. Won't that happen here? Um, it, it would have, but there were some new inventions that that uh, took place. You see, high taxation is there to support this big government. In fact, you're seeing a pagoda. We're going to talk a moment uh, about the building projects during this time. The Song Dynasty loses control of North China to the Jin Dynasty in 1126. So we actually have two phases of the Song Dynasty. We have the early Song Dynasty where they are ruling over everything. Uh, And then when the Jin takes over, the Jin only takes the northern part of the Kingdom of China, but the southern part will remain part of the Song Dynasty. And so they actually retreat. The, the government officials, that very large government that's growing, are going to retreat to an area south of the Yangtze River. That's going to be the cutoff. Um, and that will continue for another uh, couple, uh, 100, 200 years or so. Um, now, I said, how can they have that very high degree of government, very um, very congested government, um, and not fail under the taxation. And agricultural innovations had led to prosperity and population growth in the South, in the Song Dynasty, um, where they uh, determine a way to, a, a new way to grow rice. Actually, it's a new breed of rice from what I understand. Um, where instead of uh, growing it and then harvesting it, within a single year you can have two, maybe three different harvests, which means you can now feed two to three times as many people. And so as goes the food source, so the population uh, begins to explode outward in the Song Dynasty. You also have industrial advances, uh, like uh, gunpowder leading to the invention of the cannon. This is a very early uh, sort of portable cannon uh, that that has been found. Uh, You have the invention of the the odometer, Uh, you know, how you get in your car. You can see how many miles you've you've come. Well, they didn't have cars, but you have a a cart. uh, And notice it's got a gear mechanism where it will record how many miles you've uh, you've sort of pulled this cart. Now, I'm not saying every cart is, uh, has those, but now measurements can be taken uh, to determine uh, how long a road is, and these things will be taken and written down. The invention of the magnetic compass, uh, and of course, a magnetic compass doesn't point to the North Pole. It points to an area that has to be a, a bit in the north, but but it's offset of it. And this was understood by the Chinese. They actually had figured out, well, well, there's where the North Star is. There's there's where North really is. And here's where the compass points. It's, it's slightly off kilter a bit, but that's okay. And they were able to use that. And this is going to help advance their their naval exercises. You also have the invention of movable type now, this is long before Gutenberg's printing press. That's going to be uh, for, for around 1452. Uh, this is uh, during the Song Dynasty. Um, but th- that also has some limitations because China doesn't have uh, a nice, easy set of 22 or 26 letters in their alphabet, uh, but rather there are uh, many thousands of characters. And so, yes, this, uh, this leads to printing, but it's not quite the same as what we have with our printing. You have building codes uh, for high-rise buildings uh, being built at this time. Um, and of course, the building codes are necessary to make sure uh, that they are structurally sound and that they will not collapse. And you also have the building. Remember, we talked about the canals, but sometimes those canals have to <laughs> uh, go go to a higher elevation. Uh, water doesn't go uphill, so how can you do that? And they construct mechanical locks in the canals so that water can be moved, and you can actually have a ship that uh, or a barge that sails up the canal. And as the uh, as they begin running out of water, you can actually uh, move the water and move that. Uh, 
that barge to a higher level, uh, level, a higher elevation, even though it's still in the water. Foot binding, and uh, this is just a sort of a uh, an interesting cultural phenomenon. It gains popularity popularity among the rich, where this idea of uh, taking a girl's uh, feet and then binding them so that they are not permitted to grow. A small feet was considered a, a desirable quality among rich girls. Now, with poor girls, that was a different matter. Um, and what that's going to mean for them is they're not really going to be doing a lot of walking because if they're rich, they shouldn't have to walk. Uh, and so uh, just sort of a cultural phenomenon. Now, that comes to an end with Genghis Khan. Uh, the dates for him, 1162 to 1227, and uh, his name is Temujin, means man of iron. Um, Genghis Khan is his, uh, his title. Um, and he uh, unifies the Mongol tribes to the north of China. Uh, he brings about a unity, and then he comes in and conquers that Qin dynasty, uh, that Jin dynasty, which is on the, uh, remember, they're ruling in the north. Um, and so they are conquered by Genghis Khan. We have the growth of the Yuan dynasty uh, under Kublai Khan and his successors. Kublai Khan is the, the grandson of Genghis Khan. And he manages to unify all of China now. Um, and it's during his reign that we have the travels of Marco Polo, a, uh, a Italian merchant who comes now uh, into China and actually works in the court. He, he is given an official assignment by Kublai Khan, who, who is so impressed by this, by this young man. Uh, and he works for him for some 17, 18 years and travels all throughout China uh, and then is going to go back home at the end of that um, just in time to get arrested by... Uh, uh, there had been an actual uh, war between two cities in Italy and he comes back and, and uh, gets captured by the opposing city and put in prison. And he's in prison for a few years. And while he is there, he is telling stories of his travels to his prison mate. Uh, and they are eventually taken and published. Remember, they don't have a printing press yet, so it has to, uh, all copies of books have to be handwritten. But they are. And the, the adventures of Marco Polo become uh, regular reading uh, throughout uh, Europe at this, um, shortly after this. And a lot of people had thought, uh, well, gee, a lot of those stories, they, they seem to be quite far-fetched. They, he must have just been making them up, nothing to, else to do in prison while he was there. But now that we've been able to study Chinese history, we say, my goodness, he was right. All these things that he described now have been, um, have been seen to be true. Uh, he wasn't just making it up. He was really telling of his true adventures. You have, in the, during the Yuan Dynasty, advances in science, in mathematics, but the successors of Kublai Khan lost control over the Mongols. Uh, remember, Genghis Khan had brought them all together. Uh, now they go out and do their own thing in the north, and he loses control over them. And you have a gradual loss of power in succeeding generations. Um, I think perhaps as... <laughs> As the dynasty is becoming more and more, more cultured, more and more set in Chinese way, ways, they're forgetting that Mongolian heritage and perhaps that strength that had given them the empire, and now they are going to lose it and they will be driven off. Now comes the Ming Dynasty with the defeat of the Mongols. And notice we're going from 1368 to 1644. Um, it's during this time that the Great Wall of China is completed. It had been started much earlier, but after all, this, uh, this is a huge undertaking. Now, the Great Wall of China had been started over a thousand years earlier, um, with sections of it being built. And, of course, that hadn't kept the Mongols out. They had just uh, gone around to those sections that were built. Um, but now it's completed. Now, when I say it's completed, it doesn't look, uh, this, it's not the same construction type all throughout. Uh, there are places where it's uh, very ornate, like what you're looking at here. There are places where it's an earthen wall, uh, much lower. But nevertheless, it stretches 5,000 miles across the northern border of China. You also have the building of the Forbidden City, 
Um, the actually, it's Chinese name, and I'm not going to pr- try to pronounce it, but it actually takes its name, at least in part, from the North Star, which was considered uh, sort of the the center of the heavens. Remember, when you look to the north, there's there's one star that really doesn't seem to move. And the idea here is here's a city that is that is uh, so special. Now, the reason it's called the Forbidden City, it, the idea is that no one could enter or leave without the emperor's permission. You have an army now of a million men. This is uh, the greatest army that has ever been seen in all of history. Uh, This is under the Ming Dynasty. And you also have a navy constructed at this time. Uh, A fleet of 300 ships. Uh, You have nothing like this happening in in Europe. Uh, Remember, around this time, you're going to see uh, uh, 1492. We're going to see Columbus sails the ocean blue, uh, and he's going to have three ships, and they're going to be fairly small compared to what we'll see with the Ming Dynasty. Um, the, uh, The Ming Dynasty will make voyages to Africa, to India, Possibly, you know, this is this is, uh, argued and disputed. Uh, possibly all the way to North America, but that's you know, we're going to put a question mark there. Admiral Zheng He is the hero of the oceans for this period. Uh, he had a Muslim background, had been uh, captured, and uh, his father had been a prince of Persia. And uh, Muslim per- the Muslims were persecuted under the Ming Dynasty. Uh, and so he's captured as a youth, and he is castrated, made a, uh, a servant, or maybe we'd probably say a slave. Um, but he is going to uh, be commissioned now uh, to command, to first build and then to command a fleet of ships that will take the trade of China all throughout uh, well, their world. Uh, he's reputed to have been seven feet tall, a giant of a man. And I'm not sure if that's accurate, uh, but um, I want to say larger than life. And so he sets forth um, passing through the Straits of Java, uh, places like Indonesia, going around India into the Persian Gulf, uh, and as far as the Red Sea, Africa, uh, to the and notice uh, what we're looking at here are his travels to the west. Uh, to the east, he goes uh, certainly to Japan, uh, Korea, Japan, but possibly as far, again, uh, this part we, we can't say for with any degree of certainty, uh, but possibly as far as, uh, as North America. He says, we have traversed more than 30,000 miles of immense water spaces and have beheld in the ocean huge waves like mountains rising in the sky. And we have set eyes on barbarian regions far away hidden in a blue transparency of light vapors while our sails loftily unfurled like clouds day and night. Here's a model of one of his ships, uh, and it is set alongside a model of the Santa Maria, Columbus's larger ship. Remember, the Nina and the Pinta were were quite small in comparison. Uh, But his larger ship, uh, just to give you an idea of how much bigger, you could probably take uh, maybe uh, five or ten of Columbus's ships and place them uh, inside. Uh, the the uh, flagship of Admiral Zheng He. Now, the Ming Dynasty then is having trade with Europe, both across the Silk Roads, but also uh, by ocean. And we have uh, things that are making that transit, that are, ta- that are now traveling to Europe, like gunpowder, like the idea of having plane cards, uh, you know, um, people who like to play with cards. Uh, that's that's a Chinese invention. Uh, silk, of course, we've already called it the Silk Road for good reason. Um, tea will make its way uh, into Europe, but eventually we will see a decline uh, in the Ming Dynasty. Um, I'm not sure if they would have called it a decline, uh, but uh, after a while they're going to say, uh, I, I, we think that the ships have gone far enough uh, we're actually going to put a stop to it. Uh, I think one reason is perhaps they're saying uh, they they have nothing that we want. Uh, we want to keep Chinese jobs in China. Oh, uh, there's nothing there that we want from Europe. Uh, we don't need it, and we don't really want um, their uh, their influence coming in our direction. 
You also have the period during this uh, arena, at least in Europe, of what's known as the Little Ice Age, where you have you'd had global warming prior to this, uh, not caused by by uh, machinery or anything like that, but just because sometimes climates do change a bit. Um, and now it, there's a cooling effect during this era, the Little Ice Age, uh, and that has its effect in Europe, and it also has its effect in China. You also began to have European inflation, where um, because you know initially a, a lot of the products that were going forth uh, were highly valued, but now that actually begins to change. Um, all that silver has been going to China, and so it's it's becoming more valuable in Europe. And China doesn't want to; they want to get rid of products. They don't want to get rid of silver. Um, and so uh, uh, you actually have sort of an economic imbalance that will lead to a to a slowing down, not a ceasing, but a slowing down of trade that's going to and from China. From 1500, and I'm quoting here from Neil Ferguson's book, Civilization, from 1500, anyone in China found building a ship with more than two masts was liable to the death penalty. In 1551, it became a crime to even go to sea in such a ship, where China says, China for Chinese, uh, no one's sailing out there, uh, we are going to stay here. We've built our wall. We're going to be behind it. Uh, we don't want any more immigration, any more things coming in here, nothing going out. Uh, and, and they particularly are going to, to hold on to that when it comes to, to sea travel. The Ming Dynasty, the last emperor, is uh, Zhu Yuan. Uh, he's the last emperor of the Ming Dynasty, and he... Um, he holds himself up. He isolates himself in the Forbidden City. He doesn't really want to hear about news from the outside. He's, he's sort of the whole nation sort of encapsulated in, in this one individual. And uh, he, actually, he's not really taking an interest in ruling things. He has his eunuchs, his palace servants, who are doing the actual ruling. And meanwhile, in the north, you have the Manchu invasion. We will actually refer to that as Manchurian uh, China in, in the future. Uh, he kills his own wife and his daughters and then hangs himself because he doesn't want to see uh, what this invasion and the fall of his family, what that will look like. Now we have the Manchus, as I said, they're coming from the north, uh, actually the northeast, and we're going to call that Manchuria from now on. Uh, this is north of the Great Wall of China, and this will now bring forth the, uh, the Qing Dynasty as Manchuria conquers China, and not only China, Indochina, that is the inland area, and Korea and Tibet, um, marching out a number of those areas that look like uh, much of modern-day China today. Now, the kings uh, of the Manchu, they maintain their own language. They have their own language. It is not Chinese, uh, and they are going to continue to speak. It's, uh, it reminds me a little bit of how when Alexander the Great had conquered uh, um, most of the Middle East, and for example, in Egypt, you have a, a Greek king in, in Egypt. Um, the Ptolemies are going to rule Egypt. And when they do that, they don't learn Egyptian, the Egyptian language. Instead, they continue to speak Greek. And if you want to speak to the king, you have to learn Greek. Well, the same thing is happening now with the Manchu language. Under the Manchu, all Chinese were required to have the forward part of their heads shaved and they were to grow long pigtails. Both of these were considered signs of their submission to the Manchu. Uh, furthermore, the Chinese themselves were forbidden to learn the Manchu language. Um, they wanted to make a distinction between the Chinese people and themselves who were ruling over the Chinese. The long reigns, actually long reigns of their first, or, or I don't know about first, but early two kings, uh, the Emperor Kangxi, uh, notice he rules from 1661 to 1722. And likewise, a bit later, you have the Emperor uh, Quinlong 
rules from 1736 to 1795. Uh, these two emperors uh, ruled for an especially long time, and, and that gave a certain stability to the, to the Manchu rule. Notice it's going to last all the way until 1912. Uh, Central and South American crops were now introduced, uh, like corn and peanuts and sweet potatoes, uh, and these were these were brought uh, to, from from Central and South America into China, and they helped supplement uh, their diet. And these were things that could be grown. Now you have technological innovation that is discouraged. Notice there's uh, uh, these two ideas: social stability versus technological. Uh, technology and innovation. These are considered at opposite ends, that if you want to have social stability, uh, so went the Chinese philosophy. Uh, just uh, get rid of technology, don't have any innovation, uh, just uh, do things the way you've always been doing it, and that will give you a measure of stability. And the Qing dynasty adopts this idea it becomes their sort of standard operating procedure. And as a result, everything sort of stops with regard to technology. That doesn't mean the technology they already have goes away, but no new technology, no inventions, no innovation, all those sorts of things begin to be discouraged. We've already uh, seen that sea travel had been limited. Now it is absolutely forbidden. The, the statement goes out that not a stick shall go into the sea. Uh, we have built our wall in the north. We have the ocean as our wall in the east and in the southeast. And, of course, the uh, the uh, Himalayan mountains to the southwest. Um, we have our walls, and we're sticking th to it. And nothing, the idea is that nothing goes in and nothing goes out. And, of course, that's not going to last, especially in the age of exploration and the age of travel, where we have Europe uh, eventually coming to the doorstep rather forcefully, and into China. Now, the opium trade is one of the things that launches a big conflict with regard to Europe entering China. And that was when, when English uh, merchants, uh, they came across opium in India, that's where it was grown, uh, and then they were looking for a place to sell it. They didn't have the sort of drug laws that we have today. And they found a ready market in China, where very quickly this drug became popular and you begin to have uh, opium dens and, and just uh, places where you can partake of this drug. And the British are transporting British, British merchants. Can I call them British drug runners? But they're sanctioned, they're, they're, they have permission by the governments uh, at least the British government, to transport it from India to China and, and make a big profit along the way. Uh, the Chinese government, after a while, begins to see the harmful effects of these drugs, and they outlaw the drugs. And so uh, the British merchants are bringing drugs from India to China. The Chinese government uh, outlaws the drugs, and they confiscate those drugs that are that are being stored there. They destroy them. They're not trying to sell them and make money. They just want to get rid of them. No more drugs. And the British merchants say, you can't do that. Those are our drugs. Uh, and so begins a war. Britain goes to war against China. This is known as the Opium War. So there's actually going to be several of them in, in quick succession. So the Opium War, beginning in the uh, mid-1800s, a bit before 1850, though, uh, it's, it's Great Britain against China. And, of course, uh, Great Britain is going to overwhelm China. Even though Great Britain is a very small country, China is a very big country. But remember, China had been standing still with regards to technology. Um, they, they really hadn't, they didn't have the latest and greatest weaponry. And, and England does, and England wins the Opium War. And not only do they win, uh, in the Treaty of Nanjing, um, several things happen. First of all, uh, Hong Kong is given to Britain. It will become a English possession for, for quite a long time. It's only recently uh, gone back to China. And also China is forced to pay for the drugs that were destroyed. Uh, can you imagine in the United States if our war on drugs, suddenly uh, we had uh, Venezuelan drug lords come in and defeat our government and then say, now all the drugs that you confiscated and destroyed, you have to pay for them. 
you have to reimburse us so that we can bring more drugs back into your country. That's, that's what was taking place in China. Next, you have the Taiping Rebellion. This uh, begins in 1850. Now, this is unassociated with the, with the uh, opium wars. Uh, this is an internal rebellion. Uh, you have Hong Qin uh, Quan. Uh, he's supposedly a convert to Christianity, at least, at least in name. I don't think he's really Christian at all. Uh, he declares that he's the brother of Jesus. Uh, and so uh, you have that, that apparently gains enough traction to, to begin this rebellion. It's really sort of a socialist rebellion. Uh, his followers t- uh, take Nanjing, and this becomes the capital of the, of the new movement. And for a time, he is, he is ruling. Notice the, the, the rebellion actually lasts for 14, 14 15 years. Uh, it turns into total war. And civilians on both sides are targeted. And the death toll estimate over these years is estimated to be between 20 and 30 million people. That's a huge amount of people that are, that are killed in this war. It, when, it, when it finally comes to an end, it comes to an end with European aid in helping to put this down. But again, that's the outsiders coming in. Um, and when it is put down, uh, this opens uh, the doors even wider for, for European merchants. We already talked about the British and their drug trade, but that's not all that's coming in. And uh, on the, I think of it as a positive note, not all Chinese did, but also you begin to have European Christians come in. They had actually been outlawed earlier. And so you have these attempts at reform, uh, a blend of Chinese culture with modern industry. Now, Japan, meanwhile, has come, to- they've come totally on board with this. Uh, Japan is, is embracing European uh, industry, European culture. Uh, they still have um, a measure of their own. This, I'm not saying they become European, but they're embracing a lot of these changes. China is going to fight it. Um, and I said uh, uh, European Christianity as well. Uh, people like Hudson Taylor, who is not just on the coast, but he actually forms what's called China Inland Missions to take Christianity to the uh, to the hinterland, the inner parts of China, where it usually had not reached. And so this is, this is all part of those reforms. Now, uh, the Empress Dowager is going to come after that rebellion. Uh, she's the concubine of the emperor. We've seen this, story, this sort of story before. And then after he dies, she takes on uh, his position. She rules China. And she turns the clock back. She says, no more reform. Let's go back to the way it used to be. This is all under the Manchus. Let's go back. Let's shut off, shut off all foreign influence. Let's pretend that all these things never happened. Uh, let's oppose all reform. And it's in this light that you have what's called the Boxer Rebellion. This is a rebellion uh, in uh, right around 1900. Um, the reason it's called Boxer is because um, it's named after the Chinese martial arts. Uh, they thought of them, you know, the way you would they didn't have a word for martial arts or, or kung fu or things like that. And so they called them boxers. They fight with their hands. Uh, and it was put down very quickly. Uh, it's not going to last at all. And so, again, um, this, this attempt to throw out European influence has failed, and it has failed miserably. Boxer Rebellion, 1899 to 1901, like I said, very short, just a couple of years, anti-Western, also anti-Christian, um, because uh, Christianity was seen as one of those Western influences. Uh, and so these, uh, uh, the, the Chinese uh, are thinking that their martial arts is going to uh, wipe out the Westerners. Uh, instead, uh, uh, I remember I actually studied martial arts in my younger years, and, and someone asked uh, my instructor, what's the best kind of karate? And he looked at him with a straight face, and he said, gun karate. Well, that's the kind of quote-unquote karate that the, uh, that the Westerners had. They, they didn't have martial arts. They had guns, and uh, guns are faster than martial arts, and they were quite effective in putting that down. The emperor, uh, Quan Zhu, was poisoned after a constitutional monarchy was proposed. And so we're putting an end now 
to the Qing Dynasty, and this marks the birth of the Chinese Republic. It's not a republic that's going to last very long. Uh, that's going to be overthrown, and we'll come into the 20th century with some new forms of government, but we'll leave that for the future. In closing, I want to uh, revisit, we've talked about this before, this idea of Western thinking versus Eastern thinking. Um, in the West, respect is something that is earned. We actually say that. Uh, that's a saying among uh, us Westerners, that respect has to be earned. In the East, and particularly in China, respect for hierarchy is supposed to be inherent, and very often is. You know, that's, that's why you would have these very long dynasties, some that ruled uh, many years, even hundreds, uh, many hundreds of years in some cases. In the West, open debate is encouraged. Uh, in the East, open debate is um, either open debate or confrontation is to be avoided. Uh, the saying there, uh, you know, we, we say that the squeaky wheel is the one that gets greased. They say the nail that is standing up gets hammered down. Notice it's, it's quite the opposite. In the West, it's very individualistic. In the East, they are um, much more collective in their thinking and in their orientation. In the West, we have this idea that we say, follow your dreams. In the East, uh, instead, they emphasize the duty toward others, even in their mythology. Remember how we had the legend and the ballad of Mulan? Uh, she was doing her duty toward her father. You know, that's not an individualistic rebellion. Rather, she's fulfilling a duty toward father and, and emperor and nation. In Western thinking, we like to think about conquering your goals. Your goals are something to be conquered. In the East, the emphasis is said, this goes back to Confucius, conquer yourself. Western values in government, then, we value impartiality. Uh, for example, if, if a case goes to court, you expect that the judge is going to be impartial. In the East, instead, it's expected that you will have filial piety. And by that, you mean uh, that you're going to keep it in the family. That, of course, if somebody is your brother or your cousin, you're going to show deference and partiality to them. That's considered a positive quality, not a negative quali uh, quality. In the West, uh, we have this idea of democracy where the people make the decisions. In the East, the sovereign leads. That's what he's there for. He has the mandate of heaven. That's the way the universe is arranged. In the West, we value diversity. In the East, there's really one way we ought to do sort of everything. Now, uh, I think that there's, there has been some Western ideas that have infected the East in more recent times. But traditionally, that's what the East values. In the West, they value strength. We value strength. In the East, they value wisdom. Finally, I want to look at uh, our timeline. Um, I'm just putting Napoleon at Waterloo so you get a sense of, of other things that are happening. Uh, we talked about the Opium Wars, um, the early part and mid part of the 1800s, the Taiping Rebellion uh, come after 1850, the Boxer Rebellion, uh, 1899, 1900, 1901. And finally, of course, uh, we're going to come in the future to World War I and World War II. And the reason I want to mention all of these is that the Chinese see this period from the beginning of the Opium Wars until after World War II. Notice what that brings you up to just before 1950. That brings you up to uh, what we think of as the Korean War. But the Chinese were involved in that. And notice that period of the Opium Wars all the way up to after World War II and the beginning of the Korean War, the Chinese refer to that as the century of humiliation. Not just the uh, the Chinese versus the Manchu, but all of China, its, its leaders and everyone on downward, uh, found themselves under the, the thumb of Europe. And only at the end of that era, after basically 100 years, uh, have they come out from under that. And that period since then has become a new chapter in Chinese history, a chapter that is still growing, developing, and is still being written today. What led the West to becoming the leader 
in civilization. Neil Ferguson asked this question in his book, Civilization. He outlines a number of factors. Uh, he points out that you have competition in Europe as opposed to in China due to political fragmentation, whereas in China you have uh, the Ming Dynasty that's holding everything together and they're all under one head. In Europe you have many different little kingdoms and they're all fighting against each other. They're competing, each one trying to be better than the other. The, the other. Uh, chi- the scientific revolution, where at the beginning of that period, at the beginning of the Ming Dynasty, the Chinese had been far ahead scientifically, but now they are, uh, they are bypassed because they're standing still. And so while in Europe you have a scientific revolution, that does not, uh, that does not come to China. Uh, in, in Europe you have the rule of law providing for private property. In China, the emperor basically owns everything. You're allowed to sort of have a little bit, uh, but it's subject to the will of the emperor. So the idea of private property is not something that you had all throughout China. And of course, uh, modern medicine is something uh, that that goes with the scientific revolution um, that uh, certainly was beneficial um, to Europe, and it took a long time for that to make it to China. Finally, uh, in Europe, you had a consumer society. <laughs> I think it was Adolf Hitler who called uh, Great Britain the nation of shopkeepers. Now, he meant that in a negative way, but there is a sense in that helped mold society and it helped mold all of Europe, and it did not initially help mold China. And so you have the society that's all out for advancement and competition and consumerization. Um, Is that a good thing or is it a bad thing? It's just a thing that Neil Ferguson points out. Finally, in this this final area, uh, because it's a consumer society, you have a work ethic that that came known, in fact, we're going to refer to it in Europe, sometimes as the Protestant work ethic. Um, In other words, in certain parts of Europe, you'll see this, perhaps not as strongly in other parts. Um, But you don't have quite the same thing, at least initially, in China, although you're going to see it develop among the Chinese people, but it will look very different. It will have that, it will have that communal mentality. Nap- Napoleon Bonaparte called China the sleeping giant. He said, let her sleep, for when she wakes, she will move mountains. Let her sleep, for when she wakes, she will shake the world. And it's interesting to look at the history of China since the Korean War, the, the history of China today. Uh, can, I, can I suggest that it looks very much like the giant has awakened?